Theater Talk. I'm Susan Peskins. We always love having our next guest. He's the best, and he has a wonderful new, very funny play, which is about gay marriage. So, here to introduce him, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. You always say that with such disdain, <laughs> Susan. You see what I'm up against here, Paul? All the time. If the, if the swear word fits. <laughs> um, Paul Rudnick is uh, one of the uh, funniest playwrights around, one of the funniest New Yorkers as well. You know his plays Jeffrey, I Hate Hamlet, wonderful play that I love called The Naked Truth, although I believe you've changed the title now. The Naked Eye. Just to tell you a little that. about that play, it's all you need to know is it has a nun with Tourette's syndrome in it. <laughs> <laughs> there, sure. Theater goer's dollar. <laughs> what more do you want? Paul has a new play, uh, absolutely brilliant, brilliant social comedy at the Manhattan Theater Club. It's called Regrets Only, and it has a first-rate cast with George Grizzard, Christine Baranski, and the very funny Jackie. Hoffman as the uh, only, what do you call her in the White play? Jewish maid in Manhattan. The only <laughs> white Jewish maid in Manhattan. And we're very happy that Regrets Only has brought Paul Rudnick to the show tonight. Welcome. Oh, well, thank you so much. So, um, the show has a political point. It's about gay marriage. But unlike so many plays one sees in this town, there isn't a moment of preachiness in it. Did you deliberately set out to make a political point and just have people laugh all the way while they're getting the nice sh social lesson? Well, what I set out to do was to not actually write a play about gay marriage because, while well, that's a very worthy topic, mm -hmm. I thought, okay, that's a little narrow. And I, but I thought, what's, what's been so fascinating about the gay marriage debate is the larger questions it's brought up about marriage in general, mm -hmm. about why anyone gets married, about why it's such a hot button issue, about why gay people, why a young person, why older people, why has marriage, why has marriage lasted this long? Mm -hmm. And so that was, and that also struck me as a great starting off point for a real drawing room comedy, mm -hmm. for something in the, in the Philip Barry, Fifth Avenue penthouse vein. Yes. So yeah. that was what I was after. And even before I was thinking of any sort of politics, because I think politics, especially on stage, is usually interesting only in a very social context, only in... It's ma marriage interests me if it's sort of the Clintons' marriage. You know, if you're looking <laughs> yes. at okay, or I guess well, one of the characters that inspired the play was a guy not unlike Bill Blass, mm -hmm. one of the real old school kind of stand-up guys, very powerful, almost of the, the the Cary Grant vein. I mean, he mm -hmm. always fascinated me. Someone who was just sort of pure class and pure sophistication. And I thought, oh, okay, that's an interesting hero. Mm -hmm. Is this someone you really knew? No. No, no I really just admired it. him. I, there's a wonderful memoir that he wrote with Kathy Horan that I read. Um, and I always was fascinated by his friendships, often with very powerful women with, from the Manhattan social scene. Mm -hmm. And those marriages also interested me. I thought, what if you are Pat Buckley, who's married to William F. Buckley, mm -hmm. who's an arch conservative? Do you agree with him on everything? Do you finesse your way out of these situations? What happens at those cocktail parties? Mm -hmm. What happened at the Reagan White House? What happens if you want to socialize with the Bush family now? Mm -hmm. What happens when there are designers who invite Jenna and Barbara Bush to the shows? You know, how does politics interact with fashion, mm -hmm. with society, with, with personal friendships? friendship, yeah, yep. or, and relationships? And that and that is exactly what the play gets at. And it's set, we should say, um, in beautiful, elegant Fifth Avenue apartment, it's stunningly designed by Michael Yergin. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, and George Grizzard plays the Bill Blass character, Hank Hatley, who's not in any way a direct. A biographical sketch of, of Bill Blass, but it's just that kind of guy. He's a gay Manhattan designer who, you know, is an es really an establishment figure now. Yep. His name is on, you know, jeans and all that sort of stuff. Well, what interesting, I mean, Bill Blass, what I think people sometimes forget is guys of that generation or an Oscar de la Renta or of the Ralph Lawrence and Calvin Klein's, but Bill Blass was one of the first people, if not the first, to actually not just work out of the back rooms of 7th Avenue, mm -hmm. but to turn himself into a brand mm -hmm. and to turn, turn his name and his face into a logo. And in the context of the play, he is very close to Christine Bransky, a Fifth Avenue socialite married to a very powerful, successful Manhattan lawyer. Yes. Old, waspy kind of yeah. guy. And um, the friendship is tested. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because? As I think uh, many friendships are because it does involve, I don't want to give away too many plot No, we, we don't want to give, there's a wonderful right. trick in the second act exactly. we don't want, but you can sort of set it up but for there us. Are, but there is the, um, the lawyer in question, who's just brilliantly played by David Rashi, mm -hmm. 
is gets involved with uh, an amendment, the p potential constitutional amendment defining marriage as absolutely between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. And suddenly everyone in the room, everyone in the penthouse, everyone at the party has to take a stand right. or not. And suddenly the situation, the, the temperature rises. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the jumping off point as to, okay, how to, and at the same time, the couples, the social couple, Tibby and her husband Jack, their daughter, is about to get married. Yes. So suddenly marriage is on everyone's minds. Yeah. And that's where, that's where things begin and where they start to get interesting. <laughs> and it's also about people who are in no way political. Yes. You know, people who are very social, who live their lives for But I, I found it very that. interesting that even though they're not political, and not to give anything away, that <clears throat> when the issue of gay marriage was raised, that then the, the gay designer felt it important for his friends to take a stand, to, su to suddenly, that to, to be against the equal rights of gays was not acceptable. acceptable. A and do you find that? I mean, do, do that you're, you know, that when you run into people now in your day to day that, you know, mm -hmm. that they're, they're being bigoted about gays, that you suddenly you don't want to not tolerate it anymore? Well, a friend told me of a story about where he received a wedding invitation, uh -huh. and he's lived with the same guy for years now, but the invitation was addressed only to him. Yes. And yes. you think, okay, on the scale of, of insult and offense, that right. can seem quite minor. On the other hand, there's a real sting there. Yeah. And that's what interested me, that thought of, okay, but I, even beyond that, for the Hank Hadley character, I thought, okay, if he's going to choose to become political in any way, it has to be in character and it has to be stylish. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was after, because that's what so impresses me about men like Blass, was that sense of real personal conviction, mm -hmm. style, and refusing to, to step outside that and saying, okay, if I'm going to vote, if I'm going to march, if I'm going to do anything that might not usually be on my particular cocktail circuit, mm -hmm. it's still going to belong to me. Right. And that was the chat and that was the fun too, is saying, Okay, you know, if Bill Blass you know, goes to the barricades, what's he wearing? Right. right. You know? <laughs> well his yeah, I mean his 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 form of protest, which is a really a wonderful trick that you pull off in the second act. His form of protest could have a Bill Blast designer label on it. Well, and it has, of course, a William Ivy Long designer label <laughs> right, on it. Because right. when I wrote the play, I was William is an old and dear friend of mine, and I thought, okay, above all else, if you have a fabulously successful designer at the center of your your comedy, it's going to be a fashion parade. And who but William Ivy Long to provide that? Yeah. Now, as I was watching the play. There are, as always, um, these just wonderful, sharp, um, satiric, witty observations that um, the playwright has made about this world of incredible privilege in Manhattan. Being as successful as you are, do you move in these circles and are you always sort of keeping a little mental notebook watching how these people who live in these fancy apartments behave and thinking, I can make a little fun of that at some point? Well, only on very rare occasions, but a lot of these figures always strike me as kind of my personal superheroes. They <laughs> seem not quite human, but thrilling and fascinating when mm -hmm. you watch um, a Nan Kempner or in today's world there are even designers like Mark Jacobs and his friendship with Sofia Coppola. People like that where you think, you read about them and they seem to have these kind of enchanted, privileged lives mm -hmm. and they're always lending each other clothes and going to can. And so that, I, I rarely accompany them, but I certainly keep an eye out. But there have been occasions, once years ago, there was a, t uh, I think Vogue had bought a table at the American Fashion Awards, which mm -hmm. were at Lincoln Center, very grand, and they needed some seat fillers, basically, so I was included. <laughs> and I ended up sitting between Karl Lagerfeld and Carolyn Rome. So I could not have been in more heaven. And there went to another benefit that was for Phoenix House, and mm -hmm. they brought a lot of drug addicts on stage <laughs> in matching blazers <laughs> to talk about how all of these rich people had helped them kick Buy blazers. <laughs> and meanwhile, there were several people in the audience who, of course, had just entered rehab the week before right. for very <laughs> upscale, you know, cocaine yes, addiction. They had cashmere so it fun. was bizarre, <laughs> and you thought, and you thought, well. Everyone has good intentions here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that uh, flavor is, uh, is, is, is in regrets only, that observation that you that made. That was that, what that, I was after. I was just curious to know, um, you said earlier you wanted to write a kind of a, um, the mode of a Philip Barry or a Boulevard comedy. That's a, that, that's a genre that, that 
that's died out and you know you're single handle handedly resurrecting any sense of why it why it died out I remember years ago Wendy Wasserstein the late and and she much, wrote those she wrote in that style. not always she yeah. what she told me she had Heidi Chronicles and some of her early plays were often very episodic mm -hmm. and when she was writing Sisters Rosenzweig she said she loved the challenge of a more traditional form mm -hmm. of having a beautiful welcoming set and figuring out okay how do you get people on and off stage you need exit lines mm -hmm. you need ease and it's actually Actually, a, a sort of astonishing technical challenge. Interesting. And that was kind. Of, and I thought, oh my God! Suddenly, that seems very fresh. Mm -hmm. And especially for characters of that social caliber, that's where they live. And the fun would be in seeing how could you combine a Philip Barry world with a kind of South Park situation yes. and uh, some Charles Ludlam insanity. Yeah. Well, you've done it wonderfully. It's a, it's Thank just a, a, a sparkling, sparkling play. And we wish you luck with it. Uh, oh, Regrets thanks. Only by Paul Rudnick at the Manhattan Theatre Club. Don't miss this one. It's, it's really terrific. Oh. Thank you, Paul, for being our guest tonight. Thank you for having Please me. Please come back. Always a pleasure. Hank, I love you. You know that. I consider you a member of our family. And this whole amendment business, it's just a precaution. The president just uh, needs to send a message to, to, to reassure people. Which people? Well, people on the right, religious people. But you know, I've never understood deeply religious people. And I mean, I admire them, and I think their faith is so amazing. But they pray, and they pray, and... And what, Mommy? And they still look like that. <laughs> A lot of openings on Broadway lately. Here to separate the wheat from the chaff are two uh, experts in the area. Michael Mustar, our old friend from The Village Voice, always here to lend us his insights and wit. And book author. And book author, yes. What is the book again? So you can La Dolce it. Master. La Dolce <laughs> January 5th. I right, I'll I'll be there. We'll look forward to that. And we want to welcome a new critic to our round table. Jeremy McCarter is the critic for New York Magazine, uh, causing quite a stir out there. Everyone's reading you and talking about you. Congratulations and uh, welcome to you. Theater Talk. Thanks very much. Um, all right, um, the times there are changing, completely trounced by just about everybody. Where did Twyla Tharp go wrong on this, Jeremy? Well, yeah, she's been she's been trashed by just about everyone to the extent that now I almost feel bad for her because it's not as though she did something that was dishonest. It's not as though she sold out. She thought that she was doing something new and innovative, and you know she would find a way to put Bob Dylan on stage, and it didn't work. There, you know, it certainly did not work, but. Uh, I think it was just deeply conceptually flawed. I think there's something about Bob Dylan's songs. I mean, in some ways, they're the last songs that you would try to put on stage. Why? Why is that? Well, I think there's so much in them to begin with mm -hmm. that you either need to... I, I mean, either approach, I think, is going to be troubled. You can either try to go with the lyrics to the strange, incredibly strange places where his lyrics are going, or you can try to do something else with them. But if you do something else with them, then you're running against the Don't lyric. Don't do the circus. And, uh, yeah, the circus is a good but example. But I think this was so not the fault of Bob Dylan's songs, which I found when I closed my eyes and listened to the words were really quite eloquent and wonderful. I thought the fault was that well, he's not blaming Bob Dylan. Well, yeah, no, no, but no, but then I think you could have made a wonderful musical out of Bob Dylan. The problem was that it was, it was a horrible idea. But mm -hmm. she kind of abandoned the hit formula of moving out, which told its story through dance right. and went for mainly singers telling the story through songs. And it was another case of trying to cram these songs into a shoehorn of a plot where it didn't add up to a plot. It was really Cirque du Soleil. And the only time that the, the lead guy, or the understudy when I saw it, seemed to be very triumphant when he got to a lyric about the jugglers and the clowns. Oh. Like, so it all kind of made sense. Bob Dylan was kind of writing about a circus. Also, I felt that it, dramatically it was pretty inert. It had no uh, propulsion to it at all. Right. And you, she, you know, I think she's a great choreographer, but when you are dealing with something that's sort of stopped in its tracks, when you haven't found a narrative that moves along, you feel then that she was really kind of dressing up the dance spits and adding so much to it and, and you could really feel her working to try to cause some excitement where really nothing was and, happening. And please a moratorium on mimes for the rest of the 21st <laughs> century. But, but more trampolines I think because no matter how <laughs> tedious it got there is something just really satisfying about watching people bouncing around But to me it seemed like the trampoline sat there for two hours and they used it at the very end. Somebody went like that and it was like <laughs> for that I waited and you know there were flashlight dances and animal numbers and it all amounted to just circus. So lame. Yeah, sorry to say. Um, Nathan Lane is back on Broadway uh, in the Simon Gray play Butley. Uh, did he uh, pull off the uh, English accent? Uh, I, I yeah, don't I think. I think the English accent it. was okay. I don't think that was the problem. Was it so it was the performance. You pulled off yeah, the role. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I'm feeling sympathetic. I, something's wrong with me today. You're to not done, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I thought. Uh, <clears throat> 
But I thought, uh, I can see why he'd want to stretch out, Nathan, because he's, you know, this is so unlike anything that he normally does. It's so unlike the persona that he usually has on stage. But I thought he should have been pushed more. I wish the director had pushed him a little harder. Nicholas Martin. Nicholas Martin had been, had, had, uh, you almost need to play against that persona. He has this exuberance on stage. It's one of the reasons why we love him so much. Mm -hmm. And to play a character that is, that is so far from exuberant has all these things wrong with him. Um, How I, would yeah. you have pushed him when you say push him? I think... I think dig a little more deeply. Well, part of it was, you know, I thought the suit was a little too nice. I mean, mm -hmm. the, there are just ways in which there's, there's a kind of grime, there's a kind of disrepair that I just never see on Broadway. It just doesn't happen. There's something about putting, when you put certain material on Broadway stage, all of a sudden it becomes pretty and cleaned up. Yeah, and yeah. you certainly don't want something like that to happen with this. You know, it's interesting. Um, I was thinking about The Odd Couple. Um, Nathan, again, and he, even playing um, Oscar Madison, he never seemed quite schlubby or messy enough, and the apartment never seemed quite messy enough. No, that was a horrible quite, messy quite apartment. Quite messy yeah. enough. Right, and there again, I think it's, right, it's the whole approach. I mean, even from, the, I remember I even mentioned it in the review that even the art, even even the illustration that they use in the posters and the marquee, it just it just felt it too, too cute mm. somehow. I for, sort of enjoyed it, but, uh, and I'm not just saying that so he wants spiral into a depression. <laughs> well, no, like, don't spiral into depression. know how delicate he is. Um, Grey Gardens just uh, opened on Broadway, moving from off-Broadway. Uh, it's about um, Big Edie and Little Edie, and it's uh, sort of a, a gay cult thing. So, expert on gay culture, Jeremy. Did you like this? Uh, <laughs> I thought that was going to be me. I thought that was him, too. <laughs> Did you like this? For I was a joke. Um, I, uh, <laughs> does, does, does Grey Gardens, uh, the story of um, Edie and Little Beals, or other, does it work uh, as a musical? Uh, not exactly. Uh, I think uh, I think there are things in it that work very well. I think Christine Ebersol's performance is astonishing. Uh, but I th there's something about the material that just resists being dramatized, I think. The, the first act is interesting in parts, but then the second act, there's really nowhere for it to go. And they've tried. It's better than it was uh, off-Broadway, I mm -hmm. thought. But uh, but I also I also really dislike the film, sort of intensely dislike Why? the film. I just think it's th that there's something... I, 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 I'm sure you're going to take a totally different view on this, but but to me, but there's. <laughs> I can see his face. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just but, burning up here. Uh, but you don't me, like Grey Gardens. <laughs> What's wrong with you? But there's something. I, I just find it. I find them deeply sad, and I know there's well, that. Deeply okay, sad. Okay, well, it's a movie about sad people. Right, but there's but there's a, there's a sense there's a sense in which it's become a kind of like you know document that's celebrated, and there's this there's this move in the second act. There's a line, something about character, or maybe it's the first act. Characters. What is it? Character is is turning something into a triumph. Uh -huh. Turning something into a triumph. I wish I could remember. Um, but, but I thought I know it, you're talking about. in a way it was like the key line. They're of the made show, heroic and now, and they were they were sad and even. pathetic grotesques yeah, yeah. in the movie, and now they've made them into what musical comedy heroines. Uh, yeah. Well, but, but there's isn't something that triumphant the about them and the way they carry on despite everything falling apart around them. Yes. In a way, this was the first reality show. You know, I like the Nicole yeah. Smith show, so maybe I'm a little biased here. <laughs> but these are people who had everything, and that's what's portrayed in Act One. It's done as a Philip Barry kind of Cole Porter, uh -huh. Daffy musical. They made it much clearer now in the move to Broadway, planting the seeds of their demise later, hmm. and the mother's hideous hold over the daughter. And um, by Act Two, you see the resilience of these two women, and not only in the fashion and the incredible fortitude that she displays with wearing schnoods and all kinds of things, but eating cat food, yeah. and taking whatever's available to just keep going but and, and to dr drive out the regrets and, and keep going with singing and, and poetry recitals. To me, it's a very skitzy kind of musical. I thought the second act was a wonderful, progressive musical, mostly the dialogue's taken from the movie, yes. is it not? But the, then the first act is this very traditional kind of stale material setting up the, f the second act, and I would have thought think they would be more inventive. They could have added ten minutes to the second act and made a ninety-minute, really hip, hip thing instead of having sort of this jury. Well, no one's going to be happy with this result, but they went yeah. for a very bold decision. Instead of just doing the movie and adding songs, mm -hmm. they said we're going to set the seeds of their demise by doing an act one. But didn't they write act two first and do that? It felt like I, that. It felt like two different. No, I think they went into it knowing that Grey this Gardens was their fan, format. Grey yeah. Gardens fanatics here, obviously. You're going to put us down. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to out you, Michael, <laughs> yeah. but what is it about oh. Grey Gardens that has such appeal for gay people? It's like I say, two women who had it all. They were the toast. They were Jackie Kennedy's aunts. And two women who had it all. So you're... And, and it all crumbled around them, and they, they're still in the and same this is house, what gay people and they turn into whatever happened to Baby yeah, Jane. How you do the, you not love that? I'll tell you the appeal it has for middle-aged ladies. It's tough out there, and, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, as you say, you they're just dealing with it. 
in the craziest way, but that's something. I found the musical more palatable than the movie, which is so depressing. I, I can't sit through to the end. They're also but artists. I will get the DVD. The, that these two women are artists, and uh, yes, the DVD coming out, yeah. I wrote the essay. Yeah. Uh, and I have a book with Dolce Musta. <laughs> uh, but the, the, <laughs> these two women were artists and bohemians, and Act One kind of shows how they're driven away from the con conformities of society. Yes, but Michael, they're they couldn't too make a eccentric bad. and too creative. They couldn't operate a washing machine. I mean, you know, can I, and I'm fabulous. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, anything off Broadway that you've been looking at uh, that you want to call attention to? There are a few good things around. I guess Nixon's Nixon just closed, but I really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, I think Emergency at the Public is a fantastic show. What's that play about? It's a solo play by Daniel Beatty, uh, who's uh, young. I think this might be the first thing he's done in New York. He's the, the actor and the playwright. And, uh, and the premise is great. The premise is that uh, this year, you know, now, in the present, a slave ship, 400-year-old slave ship, uh, surfaces in oh, New York Harbor, right. and then what happens? And you think, and there's, you know, there are things about it that are wrong. It got a lot of bad reviews, and there's he gets you, sold. You can see why? It can, huh? <laughs> it's a slave ship. What happens to him? He gets sold. That's what happens, right? When the slaves get off the ship, they get well, sold. No. Don't mind him. No, right. but, <laughs> um, but there, are, but there are these strange consequences that happen. What did you think of wrecked? With the wrecked with, Rex. Uh, Rex. Rex. with uh, uh, Ed Harris, Harris in the Neil Oedipal, Dra Oedipal one man also show by Neil LeBute. At one point, I liked Neil LeBute's stuff, uh, but uh, that was a while ago. Because uh, <laughs> this one, I just don't know. I don't know what to make of him anymore. I really don't know what he's doing. I, I think stood in the lobby every night and gave away the ending. It's his mother. It's his mother. <laughs> I love doing that. I did it with Thelma and Louise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think he's, 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 it's a trick that he just he, keeps doing the trick again and again. So when yeah. you go to see the play, you think, all right, now what's the worst possible thing the person could do on this stage? Yeah. And that's what the ending will be. Well, it's like, and it's a trick just for the sake of the trick. For the I mean, sake of the, the trick. Sake of early trick. Stuff, that's the, the frustrating stuff. thing. Yeah. What was great is that the trick had some connection to what you've been watching for the previous mm -hmm. hour, hour and a half. Right. And that, that was what was exciting about him. But now, I just think it's the trick because it's, he feels like that's what he needs to do. Now it's, you know, oh, 10 minutes left. Okay, here it comes. Here's the and trick. Then he, and yeah. then he, you know, pulls but it But I like his misanthropy for the sake of it. I think it's delightful. <laughs> now, Jeremy, you are the youngest member of the New York Drama Critics Circle by about 8,000 years or so. Mm -hmm. What's it like being in this profession that doesn't seem to have much of a future? Well, <laughs> I, you know, if the theater has a future, the critics have a future. You know, uh -huh. the, we'll be there as long as they keep putting the plays on. Uh -huh. uh, but it's good. Yeah, I mean, even since I've been there, I've, I've been in the drama critic circle for maybe four years now or something and there's been a shift all of a sudden there are a couple more Younger people on up. the side of 40 than there were before now god forbid but, they um, have some women yeah there still are not nearly but, no, i mean there is really something kind of embarrassing about that do you I think the theater's still going to be here michael musto the theater i hate to tell you is having a golden age i read articles even in my own paper the theater is boring it's not what it used to be yeah true but guess what it's hard to even get a theater on broadway now they're all booked and they're all doing really well i remember on one show you were complaining oh the theaters are all booked the shows are running so long this is a night no this is great but it's the, what are they booked with though it doesn't I mean, matter what was broadway ever junk. booked with it was always booked with a mixture of junk and art and yeah. there's still some art there mixed amidst the dross i mean me in some ways the critics are in worse shape than the shows why? Because the, well, because, the, I mean, you know, we were talking about this, that the, the newspaper industry is, is in bad shape and that, mm -hmm. you know, it's getting much harder to publish anything that's at all long or serious. Or yeah. just, there's just fewer venues than there were before. Um, and, you know, it's always been tough. I think it's not, you know, I don't think there's ever been like a golden age for the critics. Um, but well, but let me ask you, but it's interesting. What you bring up is interesting. Is there a golden age of criticism, let's say, in the after the war, after World War II in the 40s and 50s, when you have writers like Tennessee Williams and Eugene O'Neill, Arthur Miller, really shaking up the theater, the response, the intellectual, the critical response to that is going to be dynamic as well. I wonder if at a time when we're stuck with a lot of revivals and shows that are written for the tourists, is it possible to have an interesting critical discussion over Mary Poppins? Right. That maybe wouldn't be the top of the list in terms of stuff that's really going to get the <laughs> buzzing. Although we'll see. Maybe it's going to be but some fierce deconstruction. But you're making a familiar mistake, Michael. I'm sorry, but you're picking the best of the past and comparing it with the worst of the present. We still have our street cars and we still have stuff. And back then they had shows like Red Hot and Blue and something for the boys. <laughs> and, pure crepola for the tourists. And keep in mind that Shaw, who's maybe like the greatest of them all, I mean, the stuff that he reviewed the three years he was a drama critic, a lot of it is junk. It's as bad as anything that we have to... And then he got something great, like Imports of Being Earnest. When I started writing... Like the, yeah, so. when I started writing... Like or Heartbreak House. You know. uh, when, I started, <laughs> when I started writing for the theater, they had to eliminate Tony categories because there weren't even enough yes, nominees. That's right, and that's right. Mo there were only 11 theaters Star on Broadway at the time. <laughs> that's right. Mm. And, and, I mean, do you find it intellectually challenging, though, on the whole, reviewing the current crop of things? No. 
No, you no, don't. No. No, no, I mean, every once in a while, there's something I to mean, grapple with, really. Well, you, well, see, but and you know what they're going to be. I mean, Mother Courage. The, the, there were some problems with the production, but it's still, but they got it over. And the same thing with uh, Heartbreak House. The Roundabout just did. It, it wasn't the ideal production of that play. God knows. But in the end, it, you left thinking about these things that Shaw wants you to think about. The last thing that came along, the two plays that came along recently that I think really uh, deserved, that really were thought provoking, uh, were um, Doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, which the more I think about, I've now completely changed my mind. I mean, I thought when I walked out, I was like, he didn't I definitely it. know what happened. He didn't <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, and then uh, and then take me out, which I think people still like don't understand. The more I saw that play, mm -hmm. I don't know. Four Richard times. Greenberg's play, take Richard me Greenberg. Out. Yeah, and I and uh, and there's there's so much more going on in it than I think I realized the first time. But yeah, those are few and far between. The you know book 